um, Alan Christopher Mark and confident in the knowledge or the, the hope that your spirit is with us. Thank you, Charlie. Um, it's been a great pleasure uh, to be here, uh, an unbelievable pleasure and a, a memorable week. Um, and I'm grateful to all concerned to be here in this position. So thank you again. Um, allow me to take this opportunity to um, tell you a bit about the work of mine that won the prize. Uh, it's a violin concerto called The Lost Art of Letter Writing. And the idea initially came from conversations around the family dining table with my wife Heather, our daughter Kiki, our older daughter Lottie, about whom you've already heard quite a deal, um, and the nature of, of their education. We had, uh, the, the girls were born in Berlin, in Germany, where Heather and I were living and working at the time. We moved back to Australia in about two, the year 2000, and then embarked on their further education through primary and secondary school in Australia, and found that it was a, an increasingly technology-driven and PC-reliant um, education and classroom environment. We found that not only, therefore, is letter writing itself uh, becoming a lost art, but arguably also handwriting itself uh, seems to be an increasingly endangered skill. Handwriting, out of our conversations, we came to the conclusion that it, it helps consolidate learning. It, it has important aspects of neurological in-touchness, if you like. And certainly, the, the evidence from, from talking with our two girls seemed to be that the things that they really remembered from the classroom were not PowerPoint presentations, but things where their connectedness, their, their hands-on connectedness with the learning process were, were tangible. Um, whether that be, you know, making something with your hands or at least writing with the hands. That somehow the, the, the actual physical action helps internalise information and retain it. So this did raise for me questions, as I'm often looking for sort of extra musical ideas behind the pieces that I write, not necessarily in order to write programmatic pieces about those ideas, but to help stimulate the initial process, rather than just staring endlessly at a blank bit of manuscript paper. Um, it, it seemed to stimulate ideas about these questions of neurological flow of ideas, and a sense of the very personal that makes us human. I'm not saying that technology reduces creativity. I certainly hope not, because I too use a computer in my daily life also as part of the composition process. Um, but I do worry about future generations perhaps not even being able to write without a powered apparatus at their disposal. There was an article around the time that I was writing this piece in the National Daily, The Australian, um, which said that the percentage of personal letters amongst the total number of sent articles handled by Australia Post in 1960 was 50%, and then in 2007 it had uh, reduced to 13%. We're, of course, no less in touch with one another than we were then, arguably much more so when you think of the endless phone calls, emails, texting and, uh, and social network sites that we increasingly avail ourselves of. But I kind of think that whilst we're probably communicating more than ever, we're probably saying a lot less. But how does all this lead to a violin concerto, uh, you may well ask? Taking these thoughts as a starting point, as I mentioned earlier, I often find stimulus in, in all sorts of stories or images or possibly films or other artworks. I began to muse musically upon these thoughts. I'd been asked by the Cologne Philharmonic Hall and the Stockholm Philharmonic Orchestra as co-commissioning partners to write a concerto for the wonderful German violinist Frank Peter Zimmermann. And for him to play that concerto 
with um, no less wonderful a group of musicians than the Royal Concert de Bell Orchestra of Amsterdam. The Violin Concerto as a form is a, a piece of concert music or a form of concert music that seems particularly imbued with strong connections and connotations of the classical and romantic past traditions and in particular its heroism. Um, I think it's fair to say that even the major 20th and even 21st century violin concertos wouldn't be the pieces that they are. Even Berg, Shostakovich, Ligeti, Unsuk Chin, Tom Addis, these works I think also have in, in their own way been informed very much by the heroism of the Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky concertos, etc. Um, and so I, I actually looked at writings of the past of that era to see what they might offer in terms of inspiration with this idea in mind about this lost art. I took then as a motto for each of the work's four movements an excerpt from a 19th century letter of one kind or another. These ranged from private, very private intimations of love or despair right through to a very public manifesto. And so each movement's title refers to the place and year in which the letter was written from which I've taken these mottos or excerpts. The violin itself plays an alternate role or alternating role of perhaps the author, perhaps the recipient, but more importantly, it conjures something of the spirit of the mood of each of the different letters in question. The first movement is called Hamburg, 1854, and refers to one of classical music's great and secret romances, that being the very particular friendship between Johannes Brahms and Clara Schumann. In Hamburg in 1854, as a kind of postscript to a letter from Brahms to Schumann, he quoted from the Arabian Nights the following, would to God that I were allowed this day, instead of writing this letter to you, to repeat to you with my own lips that I am dying of love for you. Tears prevent me from saying more. They weren't his own words, but he wrote them in his own hand, and for any sort of uh, residual doubts about the nature of their friendship, it does say quite a lot. Um, this first movement then, Hamburg, 1854, does relate very much to aspects of Brahms' own music. And I used as a kind of trigger a sense of flow throughout the first movement. Um, a very fascinating, for me, I found it always a very fascinating moment that comes at the, towards the end of the slow movement of Brahms' fourth symphony, an unsettled 32nd note oscillation that, um, <coughs> that always struck me as a very particular um, atmosphere. It's a diminished triad rippling over a soft, low, timpani heartbeat. And in its sort of ambiguity of, of tonal implications, it could have almost been taken from his great rival Wagner. So let's just hear this excerpt from Brahms' Fourth Symphony slow moment that I'm thinking about. continued it, if I transposed it, um, and to set up a kind of a, a, a carpet upon which the soloist might end us, enter. So allow me to take you inside the privacy of my own studio just for a moment to see what that sounded like. So very 
simple and very clunky from a technological point of view. And uh, again, here am I relying on that, that technology that I was lampooning and lambasting only a moment ago. But it gave me a kind of uh, uh, a world to enter into. And so now have a listen to how the, in the end result, the solo violin enters into that, that world. Here's the first minute of The Lost Art, the first movement. Sometimes it's a real surge, sometimes it's just a, a thin thread of silk uh, in the solo violin line. But this unsettled quality is there throughout, even at the, at the most sort of lyrical and most sort of reposed moments of the movement. Later in the movement, another work of Brahms from earlier in his life, in fact from the same year as the letter that, from which I quoted earlier, um, 1854, makes its way in as well. Um, you heard just a tiny snippet of it there. Um, it's one of the variations from his early variations on a theme of Robert Schumann. And um, again, this fast rippling 32nd uh, note atmosphere informs that piece as well. And it brings their own sort of texture into the latter part of the movement. When, when it's uh, in a very low register. These, these motives and, and this sense of unease often are played on very unbrahmsian instruments, I hasten to add, often marimba or steel drums or whatever. Um, so let's now hear the original of that particular short variation from the, Bra uh, the Schumann variations of Brahms and then the passage from the first movement of Lost Art where it sneaks in in a very low piano. One of the things that I find then inspiring in, in the process, uh, 
by using extra musical ideas is that it gives me a point of repose and, and a bit of distance from the, the nitty gritty of notes and motives and textures and colours. And I can retreat to that if I feel stuck in a musical sense. Um, but also, I must say, I, I do quite uh, get quite a, a sense of um, inspiration out of trying to enter into the psychological state, if you like. Um, somehow, for me, music is is drama. It's theatre, and and it has its own sort of psychodramas to play um, of all kinds. The the middle movements of the concerto deal with two famous artistic personalities from the later uh, the latter nineteenth century. The f the second movement is entitled the Hague, eighteen eighty two. And it's a broad, prayer-like, slow movement that takes its cue and atmosphere from a line of a letter written by Vincent van Gogh to a friend, Anton von Rappard, in which he writes, My intercourse with artists has stopped almost completely without my being able to explain precisely how and why this has come about. All kinds of eccentric and bad things are thought and said about me, which makes me feel somewhat forlorn now and then. But on the other hand, it concentrates my attention on the things that never change, that is to say, the eternal beauty of nature. Similarly, the short third movement deals with a 19th century figure who lived a troubled and notoriously unstable life, the Austrian composer Hugo Wolf, who wrote to his friend Johann Strasser in Vienna, 1886, it grieves me, but I know now for certain that it is my lot to hurt all those who love me and whom I love. These quotes, together with the quote earlier from the, the, the Brahms letter, really spoke to me and gave me lots to, to think about in terms of how a violin soloist, and particularly knowing that I was writing for a soloist as, as formidable uh, as Frank Peter Zimmermann, how they would enter into that world. Um, and certainly I, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, Frank Peter himself deserves a lot of this, this honour that I'm having the joy of sharing with you this week because he certainly entered into the world that I had laid out for him in dots and dashes on a page and brought it to life. Here's a section from the end of the second movement, The Hague, 1882.
Finally, in the fourth movement of the work, I moved back to my native Australia. Um, I found it fascinating then to consider what state um, artistic cultivation in particular was at in those various European centres at the times that those uh, letters were written in the mid to late 19th century and compare that to the rough and ready conditions that confronted white settlers and the, the prejudice that they perpetuated as well in the rough environment of my country at the same time in the early days of European settlement down under. One famous figure to emerge from that time, and one who remains our most notorious and at the same time idolised bush ranger or highwayman, was the Irish settler Ned Kelly. Kelly wrote, wrote a famous manifesto in the form of a public letter in the small Victor uh, Victorian town of Gerildery in 1879. And it was a plea for justice for both his family and other poor Irish settlers in those tough do days of colonial Australia. Looking for a better life, Irishmen such as Kelly found that they were just as discriminate, discriminated against by the English ruling class as they had been back home, and probably often wondered why they'd bothered with the long trip. He wrote in Gerildery of 1879, it will pay government to give those people who are suffering innocence, justice and liberty. If not, I will be compelled to show some colonial stratagem which will open the eyes of not only the Victoria police and inhabitants, but also the whole British army. And no doubt they will acknowledge their hounds were barking at the wrong stump. I don't wish to give the order full force without timely warning, but I am a widow's son outlawed and my orders must be obeyed. Here, the, um, the music takes on a, a drier, um, more brittle, and altogether more, more desperate, moto perpetuo sort of nature and character, reflecting uh, the sense of impending catastrophe that's inherent in Ned Kelly's famous document. So here are the first few moments, or first couple of minutes of the last movement, Gerildery, 
As I mentioned earlier, um, I'm so incredibly indebted to Frank Peter Zimmermann. It's one thing to put thoughts down on the page. It's another thing for somebody to realise them. And then it's quite another thing, again, for a soloist who also had never played any music of mine before to internalise not only the technical demands of the piece, which I think you've probably heard are already quite considerable, but um, to internalise also the, the intent behind them. And uh, as I said, I, I really don't think I'd be standing here uh, in this happy situation without the incredible efforts of Frank Peter Zimmermann. Um, and so to end, I thought I'd uh, play you the, the, the complete first movement of the Lost Art, but before I do, again, my thanks to Frank Peter Zimmermann, to uh, Mark Satterwhite for being such a wonderful uh, host this week for myself and my family. We've had such a wonderful time with you and Rebecca. And um, to all the people from the University of Louisville and the Grawmeyer Foundation and Organising Committee for this terrific experience. I won't forget it and uh, I do look forward very much to being back in Louisville um, hopefully in a couple of years uh, to, be, to be able to make music with you some more um, and I'll have my viola with me again. So um, thanks again and I do hope you enjoy the first movement of um, The Lost Art of Letter Writing. This in fact is not only Frank Peter Zimmermann but you're hearing the Munich Philharmonic uh, under the direction of Jonathan Knott. So thank you again for a wonderful time. <laughs>